All right. All right. Um, so the United States has been recognized by other countries in the condition that when a disaster has occurred somewhere around the world or are in need of aid, the U.S. is usually first to respond. Although the U.S. usually aids other countries when in need, many people ask, are we really doing enough or all we can to support our fellow man? Who is responsible for helping when another country experiences a natural disaster? The individual or the state? Society has come to the conclusion that the state will do all they can to support another country when it is needed and disregards whether or not they can actually do something to support the cause themselves. The main goal of this speech is to examine and analyze what individuals and the state can do to help other countries to prevent poverty and famine from expanding or continuing. If both the individual and the state put forth effort to aid other countries, then there would be less chaos in the world. Since the end of the Second World War, the United States has spent over $1 trillion on foreign aid, according to Doug Bandow from USA Today magazine. Among the many purposes of that spending is encouraging economic and social development in other countries. Other purposes have included rebuilding Western Europe after World War II, protecting political and strategic interests, promoting U.S. exports, and providing relief during humanitarian crisis. It seems an appropriate time for foreign aid donors and recipients to take stock of the foreign aid experience. The developing world has changed in the past four years. Some developing countries, particularly in East Asia, have grown rapidly since the early 1960s. South Korea and Taiwan, for example, were both aid recipients in the 1950s and 1960s. Now they are aid donors. Other countries, however, have fallen into extreme poverty, civil strife, and chaos or have failed to rise above those conditions. Prominent examples of dis disintegration or extreme poverty include Somalia, the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Liberia, and Haiti. In some of those cases, the United States has intervened militarily to provide humanitarian relief and restore order. The Congress is making large reductions in most discretionary spending programs, including international affairs. Why do some aid recipients develop more quickly than others? At least, 90, at least 90 developing countries have received substantial U.S. foreign assistance at various times since 1953, according to David Lightman from Knight Rider Tribune, Washington Post. Some have managed to grow and develop so that they no longer receive such assistance. South Korea, for example, was a relatively poor country in the 1950s. Today, the World Bank considers it an upper-middle-income country and no longer receives economic assistance from the United States. In contrast, other countries, despite substantial inflows of foreign aid, have not managed to improve their economic and social well-being. For example, Hugh Scott from Vital Speeches of the Day claims that 13 countries have received at least $10 million in U.S. economic assistance since 1953 and still receive at least that much in 1993? Are there conditions that must be present before foreign aid can contribute to the development of, of a recipient country? The vast majority of the scholars writing on development argue that at least in some cases, foreign aid can play a useful role in promoting economic and social progress in developing countries. But the success of aid depends crucially on numerous background conditions that relate to the political and economic policies of the recipient as well as the policies of the donor. Currently, the United States divides in its total foreign assistance funding between the Agency for International Development, better known as AID, and various other organizations. In addition, concentrating aid in one organization will reduce the need to coordinate <coughs> And one loans are intended for both. Um, in 1997, the United States allocated about $2.5 billion for bilateral development assistance, according to Winslow Wheeler from Fort Worth Star Telegram. Such assistance is intended to encourage equitable and sustainable economic growth in many developing countries. The programs and projects vary widely across many different sectors, including agriculture, health, private enterprise, education, population, the environment, and economic reform. In 1973, the Congress amended the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 to require U.S. development assistance programs 
to emphasize helping the poor segments in developing countries. Cheryl MacArthur from the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs claims other programs such as the Trade and Development Agency, the Export and Import Bank, and narcotics control programs have purposes that overlap those of the bilateral development <coughs> assistance programs but are funded separately, approximately $1.2 billion in 1997. The United States provides money to alleviate humanitarian crises around the globe. About half of the $1.7 billion the United States spends on humanitarian assistance funds, emergency food programs in developing countries. The remainder is provided to assist refugees and help alleviate natural disasters or man-made problems such as civil war. That money is not intended or expected to promote development. It is usually distributed by private and multilateral organizations acting on behalf of AIB. Recent recipients have included Somalia and Rwanda. The United States also contributes substantial funding to various multilateral institutions that provide economic assistance to developing countries. The most prominent are the World Bank Group, the International Monetary Fund, and some agencies affiliated with the United Nations, such as the United Nations Children's Fund and the United Nations Development Program. The World Bank and the regional multilateral development banks have programs that lend money at both concessional and non-concessional rates. The concessional loans are intended for low-income countries and the non-concessional loans for middle-income countries. Famine, Affluence, and Morality is an essay written by Peter Singer in 1971. It argues that affluent persons are morally obligated to donate far more resources to humanitarian causes than is considered normal in Western cultures. The essay was inspired by the starvation of Bangladesh Liberation War refugees and uses their situation as an example, although Singer's argument is general in scope. One of the core arguments in the essay is that if one can use his wealth to reduce suffering, for example, by aiding famine relief efforts, without any significant reduction in the well-being of himself or others, then it, it, then it is immoral not to do so. According to Singer, such an action is clearly immoral if a child were drowning in a shallow pond where someone could have saved the child but chose not to, putting greater geographic distance between the person in need and the potential helper does not reduce the latter's moral obligations. A quote from Singer is, if it is in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable, comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. The affluent are constantly guilty of this, Singer argues, because they have large amounts of surplus wealth that they do not use to aid humanitarian projects in developing nations. A section from his essay that I think we can all relate to is people do not feel in any way ashamed or guilty about spending money on new clothes or a new car instead of giving it to famine relief. Indeed, the alternative does not occur to them. This way of looking at the matter cannot be justified. When we buy new clothes, not to keep ourselves warm, but to look well dressed, we are not providing for any important need. In conclusion, both the individual and state should be responsible for supporting aid to other countries that are in need of help. What we take for granted, other countries would literally kill for the resources we have, such as water and clothes, wa water, food, and clothes. Although the U.S. and our society cannot fix these problems overnight, we can take it one step at a time by supporting other countries as much as we can. Anything that we donate helps, whether it is a small or large donation. We are all, we are all human beings, and we all deserve the same opportunities. If everyone in the United States donated $2, that would add up to $625,284,242. And that's just if everyone did it once. That money could be donated to help others in need of simple items like food and shelter. If I was living in a country where sources were limited, I would hope someone would help me, wouldn't you? All right, Trish, what did you think? <laughs>